I'm not, baby. Well, we're going to go live. Yeah. I know we're going to go live. It'll be like a little bit of a Okay. Yeah. Like, I know there was some good things like that. I've got you ready. You guys can go watch our ones that are going to be What's that? Do you see me? Let me try it. Oh, I think so. See my hand? told me she was tapped on you. I have it. I see your hand. And yep. Yeah, the way that the service. Yep. Hey. 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 Uh, we're just looking for those uh, boxes. They went to go down and get them. I met. I met. Well, um, my name is Noel, sorry, Beth Noel Sibular. Um, been here for two years. Doesn't feel like that, actually, because we like, had part of what we were taken away last year. And it was really sad for our speech kids because it literally took away their finale. They didn't get to go to conference, they didn't go to their district, so we didn't know how we would have done state, so it was really depressing. But yeah, everybody came back with a really positive attitude, and we had some. Uh, students who chose not to let their hard work go to waste, and so they chose to uh, continue building on what they were finishing up last year. So we have a number of students who actually um, just kind of took what they were working on and um, made it fresh and new for this year, so that was wonderful. Um, and I want to thank uh, the kids. They worked really hard. Uh, it was a crazy year because we had some that uh, switched in the middle of the year. Uh, Grace went from her OID, uh, she picked up Humorous, but then she could only do two things for conference and district, so she dropped those. And Katie stepped in, because we knew that was gonna happen. And uh, Katie was able to uh, step in for the OID. Elizabeth was doing entertainment, and she chose to switch directions and do an OID. Uh, Jeremiah picked up a serious two weeks before he performed it for the first time and meddled. So that was wonderful. Elena switched scripts in the middle of the year. Uh, sometimes that happens. Uh, we just want to make sure that our kids are, are doing things that they're well, the most comfortable with. And if they don't feel it, they, they are allowed to switch. Campbell picked up a humorous and performed it in two weeks after picking it up. So that was maybe even one week. It was pretty quick. Pretty, pretty, and she did it at the same time that she was working on her Poetry Out Loud. 
So a nod to our Ms. Campbell because not only did she make it to through the districts, she made it state and then went on. So I don't know, do you know how you did? Uh, I didn't make it through the state round, but I made it to state. You made it to state. Top five in all the state. Top, right, top five in all the state. <laughs> She did three poems for that one. And they had to be, not like sometimes we can just kind of go with the flow, and change a word here or there if we feel the, the need to. She had to memorize every single word exactly perfect. Not one word could be out of place. Switched, they all had to be said correctly. It was crazy. Um, yeah. And, and Connor uh, had to finish up his wrestling season and then joined us for a conference. Right? It was a conference, yeah. Crofton Conference Districts. Uh, after, yeah, yeah it, the, he had to get his uh, things over with. So we just, you know, we have uh, a young lady who is in basketball, so we were working around her schedule, and of course, that was wonderful. Or no, two young ladies who are in basketball, and it was a wonderful experience because we will, a, we were able to see such such, such success. And like and everything that was going on right now. So huh, love Cedar Catholic kids, the, our our stick with itness and our um, ethic. It really showed when we got we were able to go really far. So now we're gonna start with Mackenzie said that there's no passes. Um, she does a persuasive and she also is in the OID. So we'll segue to uh, Skylar Sidebeck, he has, is our informative uh, speaker this year, our only informative speaker. Um, Grace Kleinschmidt, she also has done humorous and OED, but she is just going to be performing um, her series and her poetry tonight. Elizabeth, who started out entertainment and switched over to poetry, but she'll only be doing her poetry in the OED this evening. Um, Elena Paltz, you'll be doing your humorous, which you switched in the middle of the year, so who knows for that? That was amazing. Uh, the OID at that as it gets has newcomers, fresh faces, uh, Annalisa, yes, yeah, and um, Madison. So that's wonderful. As many is it fresh faces, fresh as we can have, it's wonderful. And we have Connor. We'll be going, he will be doing extemp for you, but extemp is not. Something that's prepared. It is at the last minute. He has an hour to prepare on a topic that he draws, and he only has an hour to prepare an entire speech. Usually, they're trying to hit that five-minute mark. Four thirty. Yeah, Four thirty. <laughs> yeah. So then we have um, Jeremiah, who uh, was in duet at first, and then he switched to serious within the last uh, three weeks of our year. So, and did a phenomenal job. Grace is doing her poetry. Um, the OID Mean Girls, which, whew, we really, it was a, a really great year for that team. It's just, we just weren't able to get quite over it. But we, how but we, we did, we were like always seventh. Like, ugh, just right there. So, it's just we, but the girls worked really well together. And um, especially since they were working around some other schedules. So wonderful. And then Campbell will wrap it up tonight with her entertainment. All right. So I will um, ask you to please turn your phones on to silent or, air, or airplane mode. We all, all the judges ask that in their rounds. We will refrain, refrain from clicking away on our keyboards. <laughs> yeah, those judges, we definitely do. Um, and uh, feel free to. You know, stand up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the kids. So, Mackenzie? Yeah. Oh, you're fine. You're not. You didn't call me. Please. Heads up in the tiny, okay? Okay. <laughs> I got you. Sorry. This is a big crowd. Holy cow. <laughs> okay, hang on. I don't know if Mrs. Sindler mentioned it, but 
you mentioned that our first three are going to be going on to state. No, I Mackenzie, Skyler, and Grace will be going on to the state competition in Kearney, which will be at the end of this week. Right, and then one, one person is watching. Okay, <laughs> <four people. laughs> but the person watching is judging. She's literally going to judge you. It's my sister in law, so. So they, when we say they're judging you, they really yeah, are. Okay. And Lila so yeah, will be true. judging too. Like she'll send those. So. And I'm taking a picture for the year, but give me time. You're fine. No pressure. You got it. Take it to the man. You know that's me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. As a twin, there's probably no one more suited than myself to contemplate fairness, equality, and equity, especially between my twin brother and I. This is best illustrated in reference to our childhood Christmases, where even if the number of gifts weren't identical, the monetary value sure better be, or mom and dad would hear about it. Throughout my childhood, I was very accustomed to being treated equally to my roommate. However, as I got older, I realized that life isn't exactly fair and is often unequal. This is most apparent when we go shopping. When buying basic necessities, I've always noticed how he seems to have more money left than me. This may be because he's more responsible and I can't be trusted with the $5 bill, but maybe it's deeper than that. According to the article, The Paint Tax, The Cost of Being a Female Consumer, by Candace Elliott, on the website Listen Money Matters, published January 24th, 2019, women pay 42% more for basic hygiene products than men. This is extremely problematic for a variety of perspectives. At its foundation, the pink tax is sexist, yet its social, political, and economic implications are much further reaching. In order to address this issue, I will first address what the pink tax is, next identify the wide range of problems caused by the pink tax, and finally look at some possible solutions to this problematic pink tax. According to the dictionary.com access January 13th, 2021, the pink tax refers to extra charges placed on products and services directed towards women. Frequently, these products are pink and marketed specifically towards females. Products such as razors, shaving cream, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, deodorant, and other hygiene necessities can cost a woman about 7% more on average than it would cost a man according to the New York City Department of Customer Affairs in 2015. This results in women having to pay up to $1,351 annually in these extra costs. Most people don't really pay attention to the price differences between men and women's products, but the difference is shocking. For example, at Target, access January 20th, 2021, 2.7 ounces of degree deodorant for women cost $4.29 while the same amount for men costs $3.50. And if we look at a four pack of razor blades, for a man it costs $4.44, while the female equivalent costs $2.99. These small but significant price differences are literally nickel and diming women specifically. While there are many products that both men and women use, some are necessary for women only. As a result, women are financially penalized for basic bodily functions. The aptly named tampon tax is a luxury tax placed on feminine hygiene products. According to the New York Times article from July of 2018, Why Periods Are Political by Karen Zarak, 36 states continue to tax feminine hygiene products, Nebraska being one of them. Candace Elliott, a financial writer, stated that these types of products are anything but a luxury. And I second that. These products are necessary for women, and having an additional cost on them makes an already irritating situation just that much worse. Financially, the cost of period products can be an actual hardship for those with low income, for a box of tampons being between $7 and $10. This is a non-negotiable necessity for women and has far-reaching implications. According to Market Watch, one in five American girls will have to miss school or leave early because they don't have access to period products. This is especially frustrating as they are denied access to their education to take care of something out of their control. 
The implications of the pink tax are even further reaching than just education. Other social, political, and economic issues can be directly tied to the increasing price of women's products. This issue burdens the entire household, from man to woman, because the, the pink tax is impacting someone's mom, wife, or daughter. The unfair financial burden of being a consumer has recently been the target of several social media campaigns. Sherry Baker, the marketer and product developer who launched the Axe the Pink Tax social media campaign, said that by the time a woman turns 30, she has been robbed of $40,562 for just being a woman. According to the Cradle to Cane study conducted in December of 2015, women, the pink tax begins at birth and continues through the senior population. On average, women pay 8% more for home health care needs. These increased costs can be found on anything from adult diapers to compression socks. And this impacts the quality of care a woman may receive. Economically, the most obvious issue is that women who are making less than men have to pay more for products that are necessary for proper hygiene. Women who work a full-time job only make about 78% of what a full-time working man makes. Women bring home about 89 cents for every dollar a man brings home, according to Pew Research in March of 2019. Essentially, women are expected to buy more with less money. In an article by Lawrence H. Leith of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, he says that women are making less than men simply because they're women. Men are statistically given higher opportunities to pursue levels of education, training, and experience in the past. Women tend to change jobs sooner than men, foregoing years of experiences and pay increases. There are many examples between the pay gap between men and women, but the fact is, is we can't justify women making less than men in today's world especially when women are charged a premium for basic necessities. The pink tax, combined with pay inequality, results in women having less buying power and disposable income because they are paying more for the same types of products while making less. This problem can't be solved overnight, but there are definite actions that we can take to start making a change. Gender neutral products are a great way to start. There are several brands of companies out there that are directed to both genders. Dollar Shave Club and the razor company Billy have begun marketing their non-gender specific razors to some success. Individual consumers can ask the tax by buying products that are directed towards both men and women. As consumers, we should be looking at products that are financially sound and won't support certain taxes such as the pink tax. Emily Crockett in a March 2016 article stated that another way we can fight back against the pink tax is by buying products directed towards men. She says that there are many brands of unscented men's products that we can use as women. By buying men's products, we are decreasing the amount made on women's products, which lessens the amount made on, on the pink tax, which in turn impacts the manufacturer and the retailers. But perhaps you're like me, and like your body wash should be champagne toast scented. As consumers, we can contact our favorite companies and let them know about this product disparity. One voice may not be able to make a difference, but thousands, especially through social media, have the potential to affect change. In fact, several social media campaigns have brought their attention to consumer disparity. Groups such as Period Equity and Ask the Tax have made it their mission to end the pink tax. Burger King even spotlighted this issue in 2018 with their Chick Fries campaign, which raised awareness to the unfairness of the pink tax by selling their chicken fries in pink boxes for a higher price. Supporting these campaigns allows each of us to personally highlight the problematic practice of female financial inequality in our socially connected society. In the past four years, almost 30 states have begun legislation to remove taxes on period products, according to the New York Times in 2018. By supporting this legislation and the lawmakers behind it, we can start to decrease the gap between male and female taxation. In the Nebraska Unicameral in 2019, three female senators introduced Legislative Bill 170, which would have period products and other products such as soap, 
toothpaste, sunblock, and shampoo, sales tax exempt. Unfortunately, LB-170 has been indefinitely postponed as of August 2020. But as a new session of the unicameral is currently underway, we can contact our senators and let them know about this economic issue. By encouraging the elimination of the luxury tax and the wider availability for such products, we can start personally working for change. The pink tax doesn't end with hygiene. It also includes mortgages, haircuts, braces, and dry cleaning. While some products benefit from being gender specific, like vitamins, Racers and the like are not one of them. My toilet paper isn't gender specific, so why should my soap be? By identifying the pink tax, looking at the problematic influence, and finding some possible solutions, there is a way to achieve fairness through equity. Since men and women are supposed to be created equal, like my twin and I, shouldn't our pocketbooks be too? As a twin, I'm used to being treated equal in about everything. But as I got older, I realized that that's not always the case. My twin may be more responsible than me, but we should see the same price tag on all our products. We serial killers are your sons. We are your husbands. We are everywhere. And there will be more of your children dead tomorrow. This was a quote said by the infamous Ted Bundy, an American serial killer who murdered and kidnapped many young women in the 1970s. I have been interested in the profiling of criminals ever since I was a young child watching an episode of Scooby-Doo. As a girl, I wanted to know, what makes a serial killer tick? And by looking at the definition of a serial killer, causes and motives, exploring famous examples in their backgrounds, and finally by highlighting their portrayal in the media, we will all be a little bit closer to understanding the true inner workings of a warped mind. So, what is a serial killer? According to Robert Morton and Mark Hiltz in their 2008 publication of the FBI Symposium, Serial Murder, serial killing is defined as the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender on separate events and are open to any demographic group, like sex or race. According to J. Oliver Conroy's 2018 article featuring The Guardian, What Makes a Serial Killer? Many serial killers are victims of childhood trauma, such as physical or sexual abuse, family dysfunction, or emotionally distant and absent parents. Trauma is the most recurring theme for serial killers, and childhood is the most likely place for it to appear. The National Center for Crisis Management in 2015 published Serial Killers, Nature versus Nurture. They state that this repeated psychological trauma 
during the early stages of development can cause a child to seek relief through activities of violence. When the famous serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was young and his parents fought, he would escape into the woods and only found peace in a pile of dead animals he had collected. He later went on to kill, rape, and eat over 17 young men. When it comes down to it, every serial killer has a unique motive. So the FBI has come up with a list of similar motives to set as guidelines, including anger, which involves displaying rage towards a group, financial gain, which is when the killer is rewarded monetarily for his crimes, such as a robbery homicide. Power is when the killer feels powerful or excited when he kills. And sexually based is when the killer is driven by sexual needs or desires from his victims. After looking at the definition of a serial killer, let's look at some famous examples. The BTK killer, who, according to Morin and Hilt's previously referenced publication of the FBI Symposium, this killer first emerged in 1974 and would kill 10 total people. From 1974 to 1988, the BTK killer, which stands for bind, torture, and kill them, sent five communications to the media We he would claim credit for his killings. He mysteriously stopped after the fifth one and did not return until 2004, where he sent 11 new communications. In his final one, he included a computer disk which led to the police finding him and was revealed to be Dennis Rader. He was a married man with two kids, a Boy Scout leader, and a local church leader. All this going on during his killings. From this example, we see an innocent looking man with an ordinary upbringing, currently serving a life sentence in prison. Now, serial killers are not just exclusive to the male population. Historically, there have been both female and juvenile serial killers. As referenced on Biography.com, last updated July 2020, Eileen Wuornos is America's most famous female serial killer. Sexually abused and thrown out of her home as a child, she made her living as a sex worker on the Florida highway. And in 1989, killed the first man who picked her up. She later went on to kill five more men before finally her execution in 2002. Most children tend to leave innocent lives, unless they happen to be Michael Hernandez, who, according to Vocal Media's article last updated in 2018, openly admitted to having ambitions to be the most famous serial killer of all time. At just 14 years old, he had a strange obsession with all things evil, including music, movies, and art. In 2004, he took his best friend and stabbed him to death in a middle school bathroom. Police later found detailed plans to kill two more students. He is currently serving a life sentence in prison for his crimes. After looking at some famous cases of serial killers, let's finally look at how the media portrays them. Why do serial killers receive so much attention by the media? University of Georgia Athens graduate Julie Weiss submitted an article, Serial Killers, as a Heroes in the Media Storybook of Murder, last accessed December 2020. She states that serial killers receive so much attention because it seems to fascinate society. The media can go wild once the news of a serial killer is out, releasing many articles about this unknown killer. This gets the attention of everyone as they wait in anticipation for anyone new surrounding them. In return, this gets the media even more attention, meaning they'll publish as much as they can about the killer. Weiss says in an article that the newspaper has so much push on us that they can make us believe anything they call important. Soon after you learn the name of one of these criminals, they can become an overnight celebrity. We constantly hear the names of Ted Bundy or Jack the Ripper, and many don't even realize how bad they really were. They get their own interviews, books, and Netflix documentaries based off of them, which makes them live on forever in a good light. 
just turning on the TV, we see another new show or movie dedicated to a serial killer, such as Dexter, Psycho, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or Hannibal. All these shows glamorize the idea of a serial killer, making them seem more like well-off celebrities than criminals. This media push can just lead to society fearing more for their lives. The media can say that there's an epidemic of killers all over the world, even if there's no truth backing this up. According to Chelsea Atkins Academic Journal, the use of criminal profilers in the prosecution of serial killers last access December 2020, the media can have such a push that it can impair law enforcement's ability to even investigate without causing a national uproar. All these are ways the media glamorizes serial killers and can influence everyone around us. We are all often drawn in to those true crime stories and documentaries about serial killers, and they can make us blind to what these monsters are really capable of. By defining what a serial killer is, causes and motives, exploring famous examples in their backgrounds, and finally by highlighting their portrayal in the media, we are all a little bit closer to understanding the true inner workings of a warped mind. This is important because, as Ted Bundy once said, serial killers can be anywhere and anybody waiting for the right opportunity to strike. Well, hello, darling. Yes, I know, it has been such a long time. Well, yes, if you came all this way, I would, I would, I would love to have lunch with you. How'd you find me? Lunch. They always told us the monsters on TV weren't real because they were just figments of someone's imagination. Well, newsflash, they are real. Witness the story of a silent monster who blurs the lines of truth and reality while on a morbid quest to fulfill an addiction. Bella Rose by P.J. Pullman. How in the world did she find me? How did she find me? I covered up all my tracks and don't even have a cell phone. What? What are you looking at? Haven't you ever just wanted to, to get away? I just needed a break from pretending. A break from all the... Nice and pleasant, keeping a smile on my face. Why, yes, ma'am. Well, no, sir. It started when I was in high school. No, you're in that. I was, I was, um, too young to remember. I just remember hearing whispers of my family behind my back. Did you hear what little Bella Rose did? I heard her parents walked in. Ugh, I don't want her around my kids. Yeah, I heard him talk. But I didn't give a damn. My parents must have, though, because when I was three, we moved out of state. My first detailed memory is from when I was about five years old. I was playing outside, and no one was around. Except for a rabbit. It was a small rabbit, really, but more like a bunny. <laughs> At first, I just thought I wanted to catch it. So I went after it. 
The bunny didn't hop away really anymore. Lit. As I got closer, I saw the back leg was bleeding and dragging. The sound of the blood made me smile and all bubbly inside. I think it was my first time being really excited. I, I picked the bunny up. And it, I got even more excited. I started to, to pull on the back of the leg, and I was having so much fun! Well, I was having so much fun until my mom called for me. Now, look, I, I knew deep inside that she wouldn't understand. So I wrapped the bun hip in my dress, turned on the tears, and ran back to my mama screaming, Oh, help it, mama, help it! I found him on the ground. Oh, please save him! The look of horror on my mom's face when I unwrapped that dress was priceless. I didn't smile, though. I remembered our move. Mama hushed me and told me that Daddy would take it to the vet clinic. But I knew that rabbit wasn't going to be fixed. And that feeling was amazing. <sighs> the first time's hard to beat. I have had a few close times, though. One time in the junior high locker room, I cut a girl's leg while shaving. The idiot didn't even realize it until there was a pool of blood at her feet. Oh, oh, here, let me help. As I blotted the blood with a towel, my finger just happened to slip. And I got a taste of the deep red warm blood. In high school, a bunch of us went to a party, the real thing, with boys and boobs. The only thing missing was blood. I saw Jimmy making eyes at me from across the room. I excused myself knowing he would follow, walked into the kitchen, grabbed a steak knife. Walk to the backyard. Jimmy came out behind me whispering, where did you go? I, I know you're out here. As Jimmy turned around and faced me, I reached out and flashed as I tried to... <gasps> oh, the knife cut was so clean. It felt as if I was opening a long-awaited birthday present. I slipped out behind the trees and came running as if I came from inside. Oh, oh, Jimmy, what happened here? I have a napkin. It's going to be okay. As I wrapped the napkin around his arm, my nose got that rusty scent that only blood carries. I cannot wait to get my fingers in that crimson liquid. He looked at me and told me that I was beautiful. And he kissed me. And it was the most amazing kiss of my life. I had blood running all over my fingers. <laughs> In college, my roommate committed suicide. It was really horrible, and everyone felt so bad for me. I'm guessing you want to know how she did it. She cut herself in the little bathtub, and I was the one who found her. I got really good at tears that year. It was terrible, officer. She, she had a kid out from her bath, and I was trying to get worried, so I went to go check on her right, so I got there, and, and I knocked, and, and I knocked, but, but she didn't answer, but, but the door was unlocked, right, so I, I went in there, and, 
when I got in there, the, the tub was full of blood and her wrist. Oh, her wrist. Oh, the idiots. Do you have any idea how easy it is to convince a sheltered girl into a hot bath and give her a wine cooler? Seriously, I giggled as I caught her. I studied how to commit suicide on her computer to make sure I got the cutting stuff right. Down to the hesitation cuts out. It was so terrible. I, I touched her face and I grabbed her wrist and then I ran for the RA. An investigation was ruled. And the outcome was suicide. And the stress of a small town girl in college. Oh, after college, I had it back down south to reinvent myself. I had fun. No, I had so much fun until it became too dangerous because people all around me we were being murdered by blood draining. Could you believe that three of the people who were victims were people in my office building? And a neighbor, too? After the police showed up on my doorstep while my neighbor was hung up and drained of blood, I knew I would have to move again. Which brings me to here. I mean, I figured who would follow me three thousand miles away. Spatula, you can form them into exactly the right shape. And those unsightly ingredients become a tasty treat. Cake. Yes, wonderful, delicious cake. My selected poems exhibit four opposing approaches to cake, to cake symbolism. The perfect cake by Anonymous uses cake as a metaphorical analogy to emphasize the similarities between the love and care needed for both the perfect cake and inner human beauty. Cake and Democracy by Chris Gower uses cake in an allegorical way to persuade humanity to be peaceful. In the icing on the cake by Roberta Day, we learn in an evangelical way that we can't have and enjoy everything. In my final selection, Cake by Josh Schwark, we find the dessert showing a hypocritical take on having two opposing pleasures at once. A poetry program on cake. But, What's cake without frosting? It's something bigger than what it was. It's a combination. Frosting makes it more visually appealing. It masks the overcooked side, some air bubbles from an inexperienced or careless chef. It masks imperfections. You can't force a cake to be perfect. 
It needs time. It needs love. It needs care. When it gets these and is left alone to think, to think about what its job is, to not just be beautiful, covered with frosting, but without it as well, you will have the best cake you have ever made. You will have a cake, beautiful, on the inside and out. I don't care that you don't care about it. Caring about what I care for. And you know what? I don't care that you won't care about the only thing that I really care for. So what if I care about cake? Would you not care about cake? You care about cake, of course you do. I can see it in your eyes and by the telltale dribble at your mouth. A good cake baked makes you proud to be a cake baking citizen in a country that will let you bake cake. So what if I care about democracy? Would you not care about democracy? Would you care that there are those who are on the run from fear and violence that you could only wake up from in a cold sweat as you toss and turn on your memory foam bed. There is more happening on this earth than cake. The struggle humanity faces is to live in harmony with each other. It cannot be solved with cake. You cannot bring democracy to a country with cake. Or can we? What if we swapped non-radar detectable aircraft for dairy delectable food craft? What if we swapped 12 inch shells for 12,000 baby bells? What if we stole RPGs and gave back MSGs? What if for once everyone cared and every voice in every home would not be a voice alone? And for once, we'd all agree that we all like cake and democracy for all. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Not for long anyway. Cake doesn't settle well when it's all you've had to eat. It'll churn like butter inside you and creep up your throat to project like a cannon barreling through a wall. Cake won't sit right with you anymore because you got greedy and wanted to eat your cake first rather than save it. Know all the different kinds of cake you fantasized about trying. Black velvet coffee cake, buttercream pound cake will only be a reminder of your pitfall that led you to make yourself sick with desire for cake. But it's all you can think of when you've been wronged by your favorite dessert. You can't get the taste off your tongue. The smell of batter baking has festered in your nostrils wired to the pungent taste of red from between your teeth. But it's all you can think of. What sort of chemical reaction in the bowels of your stomach caused all this sorrow or rejected the cake? Your body has a way of telling you things. We should listen more. Cake is not sustenance. It has no value as a nutritious food. It doesn't help, only it hurts. Why would it be bad to have cake and eat it too? Why is that a metaphor of green? What else should I do with cake? It could be a piece of art, beautiful to behold, but its purpose is to be eaten. It's cake. Yes, I would like to enjoy the things I enjoy, not to simply hold them in my hands, stare at them upon a platter, and wonder what they taste like. I want to eat the cake. It was made for someone to eat. Why not me? Order cake for dessert or to celebrate an accomplishment and anniversary. No one bats an eye. But order cake for breakfast might just incite a riot. There is a time and place for cake. Society has deemed it so. We are not the rulers of our own lives. Instead, our culture dictates the rules of life. 
Stay for breakfast or for dinner, but not lunch. Bread goes with every meal. Bacon and eggs are for the morning, but at night is a nice treat on occasion. But somewhere, someone is ready for dessert. So let's eat this cake that I have procured. You and I together, let's have our cake and eat it too. You're going to end up stealing saxophones from homeless people. My mother said this to me when I was three. I cried. I didn't even know what a saxophone was, and I cried. Because it didn't take knowing what a saxophone was, know that this was a terrible thing. I know what she'd say. My mother, who in her mind is never wrong, she'd say that by the time you're three, you're done developing. You are who you're going to be at three. So she looked at me, took stock, and then projected a few years into the future. Kids absorb everything their parents say, good or bad. Usually it's the bad. The things they say often leave a mark on their young, impressionable children. Our protagonist, Jill, receives an unfortunate vision of her future from her mother, that she will end up stealing saxophones from the homeless. How will she cope with this unusual addiction? Find out in Stealing Saxophones from Homeless People by Jonathan Dorff. But she didn't have to say it. And what if she had it all wrong? Maybe I was growing up to be perfectly normal. And then why don't I start stealing saxophones from homeless people just got planted in my head? I guess it could be worse. Girl down the street, I hear her mother tell her every day, you're going to grow up to be a murdering psychotic who guts your family in our sleep with a butter knife and a pair of knitting needles? Her mother was wrong about the knitting needles. My dad, he was no help. See, he only shows up in my life in moments, highlights. My first step, he comes the week after. My first word, he leaves work early and waits outside in his car. You're going to end up stealing saxophones from homeless people. My dad? Standing right there for that one. But does he say, no she isn't? Or, honey, you're wrong. I would have settled for a, you can't know that for sure. But he just stands there, absent again. And I'm three, and my mother has just changed my world. Oh, if my dad had said something, if he had said anything, this never would have started. But he didn't. And it did. When I was five. Not with a saxophone. Not with a sleeping man living out of a bag, huddled on the street with a saxophone at his feet. It never starts out that way. It always starts with something small, something that seems harmless. I've read about addiction. I've read up on it. I go to the meetings, but the closest kleptomaniacs anonymous chapter is 300 miles away. I went to AA once when I was 12. <laughs> it's not my problem, but I figured they'd understand. I'm the youngest one there. Most of them, they could be my parents. And I get all these looks, these really heartbroken looks. Looks that say, oh, how tragic, she's 12. And that poor, poor kid. There are a lot of poor kid looks. Three women and one man, person in tears just looking at me. One of them has to be carried out. She keeps screaming, we lost our children! I try to tell her, no, I'm not an alcoholic. But she just keeps screaming. 
sleeping giant decides to turn her head and unload again. I have to take it, this landmark from my past. I have to take it to keep it safe. It starts with keeping it safe. And then it becomes, they don't deserve it. And then they didn't even appreciate it. I stop saving toys. I stop saving anything. They don't deserve it because I want it. And then finally, I hit rock bottom. I need it. I need it. I won't even miss it. And it continued. I picked up saxophone after saxophone after <laughs> saxophone. You'd really be surprised at how many homeless people own them. <laughs> Working nine to five. Do, 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 do. Ring, ring. Stephanie Dibble, it's for you. Lucy Bunker. Oh, hello, Jerry. No, things are very bad here. A new boss, a Mr. Hawkins, has just taken over. Lots of cutbacks. I'm sharing a desk with... <laughs> Someone. I'm also sharing a new personal assistant. Things can hardly get worse. See you later. Could I have the stapler? Of course. And the whole bunch. The whole bunch is all yours. There's always a million things to do and so few hands to do them all. Which is why we have the amazing gift of assistance. But with the... <laughs> um, perfect gift comes in only one package. You're forced to share. And sharing is not always caring. As, as bad as, as it gets. By Peter Lancaster Walker. Hi. This must be my personal assistant. Uh, my personal assistant. I am senior to you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. You're not. I am. You're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. I'm Daphne, Miss Dibble to you. I'm Lucy, Miss Boker to you. I'm Gina. Do I work for you both? Miss Dibble and Miss Boker? <laughs> Mainly me, Gina. I think you'll find it's mainly for me, Gina. I am the senior person around here. No, you're not. I think you'll find I am, Lucy. I started working here on a Monday, and you started working here on a Friday. Yeah, the Friday before you did. No, the Friday after I did. Um, well, um, I understood I worked for you both. Equally. Well, you come to me for jobs, Gina. No, you don't. Yes, you do. Gina, go fetch my diary. It's on the table. It's green. Yes. <laughs> go fetch my diary, Gina. It's over on the table. It's red. Oh, okay, Miss Civil. Me first. What am I doing today? In just a minute. Oh, me first. Um, okay, so... Um, Miss Boker, you have a meeting at 9 o'clock with Mr. Perkins about the Oliver case. Good. Fetch me the Oliver file. Yes, Miss. <laughs> Not yet, Gina. Let's go through my diary. Okay. 
So, um, Miss Dibble, you have a meeting at 9.30 with Mrs. Billows about the Baxter case. Baxter file, Gina. The Baxter file? Hey, I'm still waiting for the Oliver file. I want the Baxter file. Okay. Here you go. Oh, let me have it! It's okay. mine! Get it! Let me have it! Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I think that should be a good meeting. I know mine will be. Gina, take this letter to the post room. Okay. Gina, take this letter to the post room. Okay. You can't get good staff these days. I agree. Gina, go and open the door to the room where I'm seeing my clients. <laughs> ah, Gina. Yes. <laughs> go and open the door to the room where I'm going to see my clients. Okay. She is so slow. Yes, she is. It's like we've agreed again. <sighs> oh, man. It hasn't really working me here today. Gina, I bet you made a glass of water. Chills. Oh, uh, okay. Let's do it. I want a coffee. Uh, okay, that's fine. One coffee. Water. What? I want a glass of water, uh, Gina. Oh, okay. coffee. Now. Um, okay, I'll just set this the coffee machine. You don't need machines for water. No. I do not drink machine coffee, Gina. <laughs> Go into the kitchen and make me a cup of decaf. No! Milk. Um, okay. I'm still waiting for my coffee! My water is more important than your coffee. I don't think so. Water. Cold. Ice. Make me coffee. Get me my water or you're fired. If I don't get my coffee, you're fired. Okay. She is my assistant. She is my assistant. She isn't your assistant. She is my assistant. I have always had my own personal assistant. Well, guess what? You have it now. I earn this firm more money than you do. Well, you know, I was a top earner last month. Yeah, I got a prize. I didn't hear anything about that. It was kept very quiet in the company. They don't want to cause jealousy. <laughs> Must have been kept very quiet. This is a lot of me upstairs. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, did you know I was top earner for the year? Yeah, I got a bonus. I didn't hear anything about that. Yeah, it was a big bonus. See my new car? It's not that new. It isn't the in thing to buy new cars these days, Lucy. Everyone who's anyone, like you know, gets second hand. It's tried and tested. You don't get any troubles with a second hand car. I thought yours would suck last night. No. No. I was just trying to attract the attention of one of the men. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he's he, he's very good looking. There you go. Give me the coffee. I've changed my mind. I fancy a coffee. That is my coffee. He yes. can have water. That is my coffee. Gina, give me the coffee. No. Give me the coffee. Oh, oh. Okay. Get it. Get it. Now go on, off you go. 
Well, I can see what both of you are like. You don't care about the company, and you're horrible to the staff. Neither of you care about anything but your private feud. She started it. I did not start it. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. You did. I did not. Yes, you did. I, did. I will finish it. What, what do you mean? mean? I think you should both know that I am Gina Hawkins. <gasps> That's right. The daughter of the new managing director. Daddy sent me here to fire one of you. But you're both as bad as each other. So I'm firing you both. Who's going to do our jobs? I am. I will meet your clients. Oh, and I overheard what you were saying about your successes. Neither of you want a prize or a bonus. You're both terrible employees. I will go and see Mr. Perkins and Miss Billows have my desk cleared by the time I get back. Oh, and don't forget to clean up the coffee mess on your way out. speech like these other people, you know, except we don't really actually, you know, practice or work on speeches. So I'm just going to give you a basic rundown of what I do and expect. Uh, the first things you have to know is that, well, you get an hour to prepare, time, le time limit for the event is 4 minutes and 30 seconds, you can go over, there's not really, um, I don't think there is a limit. There okay. actually is a limit on how long I've never <laughs> actually went 7 minutes, but, seven but, minutes. If go, but if you go over 7 minutes, you're just talking. Yeah, no one's ever gone over seven minutes. It's, it's, it's difficult to write a speech in an hour. Other things you have to know. Yeah. Yeah. Other things you have to know is that uh, they give you a topic to write on. Like you don't have to write this random topic you pick out over for an hour. They give you a choice of three topics, most of which are political. Like for example, I got one where it was like attacks from terrorists, gun rights, women's rights. Me Too movement stuff. You know, you can get a wide variety of categories. Now, the actual topic of doing things in extent, there are a few things you, you can't have, one of which is a note card. You only, you only get one note card in extent to write your whole speech on or any main points. This is just an example of one, not for me, a uh, foreign person who did extent, but uh, Curtis Cowell. These are, this there are all three of his. A couple things you can note here is that, well, I don't think he does it, but for most of me, I put like my intro here, I'll have an intro point, and I'll have like three main points and a conclusion. Highlighted parts are if you want to go off and ramble for a little bit to get some extra time, <laughs> then you come back to a stopping point. He does the highlighted, I used to do it with a line, so on and so forth. Besides that, the step is really what you make it. You can make it serious, you can make it fun, you can make whatever you want. Now, I would suggest extent for the most you know, if you can't bullcrap your way through something, I would not <laughs> recommend it for you. Because nothing's planned, it's it's a mess. I feel bad for people who have to judge the stuff I say. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> And they get two, two minutes, they get three minutes, they get four minutes, they get four and a half minutes, and then they stop sweating. <laughs> <laughs> they're really they're really like dancing the rest of their speech. So. <laughs> but we do there's some out there that they, they have a photographic memory and, and they can, it's just crazy. Uh, but it is hard. It's, it, to me, it's, to, to write a speech in an hour, it's crazy. But it's also fun. You hear a lot of topics, you learn a lot of things. All right, Jeremiah. What's your favorite topic that you picked? Oh gosh, this year, um, I had to. They told me who was the most likely nation that was going to get nuclear weapons next, so I made a top five as my speech. Besides that, all their ones were super boring. I had one on like black rights, but yeah. Yeah, they had a lot of yeah. They had everything. Just they had international and domestic issues. Yeah. And it was, and they would update them every month so that if anything changed, like you couldn't, you wouldn't have anything on like um, 
the election in this in uh, February because the election is done. Yeah. So yeah, it would, they would change the extent topics every month. All right, uh, you're right. <clears throat> Spring, what a wonderful time of the year. The air is fresh and clean. The birds are singing. The leaves are popping out on trees. And all around the world, the crack of ball, meaning bat, can be heard. Yes, sir, spring is the start of a great season. Baseball. I've been a fan of baseball ever since I was big enough to pick up a bat. I wanted to be like all the great players. Babe Ruth, Maris, Musial, Colleen. All the games I play in my backyard. But the most inspiring player I ever watched never played in the big leagues. No crowd ever applauded him. No one ever asked for his autograph. But he was my biggest hero. A boy loves baseball, and his biggest hero is his big brother Tom. As their father had coached Tom, so too, in the absence of their father, Tom coaches his younger brother. A heartwarming selection about a young man's love for his mentally challenged brother. This is Come On Home by Pam Croggy. His name was Tom. Tom was my older brother. When Tom was born, there were some problems, so he was mentally slow. But what he lacked in speed, he made up in determination. Tom had a heart as big as all outdoors. The word quit wasn't in his vocabulary. If Tom wanted to do something, he just kept at it until he got it. Dad was the one that taught Tom to think like that. They were quite a team, Dad and Tom. Whatever Tom wanted to do, Dad was there every step of the way, helping, motivating, encouraging. They, there wasn't anything they couldn't accomplish together. That was never more apparent than in baseball. Tom loved baseball. He lived and breathed baseball. He knew every stat of every player on both leagues. His favorite team was the Detroit Tigers. He always wore his Detroit cap with the bill angled just so. He called this his lucky cap. Every spring after homework was done, Dad and Tom would go out back to practice. I can still see Tom with his big old mitt. He'd pound his fist into it three or four times and then firmly plant his feet and yell, All right, Dad, throw me a hot, hard one. Dad would throw it pretty hard, too. Even though Tom couldn't hit very well, he could catch. No matter how hard the ball was thrown, as long as it was thrown right to him, Tom could catch it. One year, Dad decided it was time for Tom to play in Little League. Unfortunately, no one wanted Tom on their team. They said he was too old, too big, or too slow. But that didn't stop Dad. He just became a coach and put Tom on his team. Tom played first base. Dad figured the pitcher and the second baseman could cover his territory. Whenever it was Tom's turn to bat, the other team would usually call, easy out. Usually, it wasn't out. But sometimes Tom would get a hit. That smile that nearly split his face was something to behold as he lumbered across to the first base. Of course, Tom never looked to see where the ball was. He just listened for Dad's voice and did whatever he was told. The most exciting time was when Tom was on third. When it was time for him to run home, Dad started jumping up and down, yelling, Come on home, son! Come on home! Tom's blue eyes would be sparkling as he crossed the home plate. You could just about see his chest swell with the pride of accomplishment as he clapped hands with anyone he could reach. Dad just told him, good job, son. But his smile was always a little bit bigger for the rest of the game. That was a great summer. Dad coaching, 
Tom playing, and I was the bat boy. We didn't know it at the time, but that was Tom's only summer of baseball. You see, Dad died the following winter, and no one else would let Tom play on their team. But that didn't let it bother him. He just became my coach, encouraging me the same way Dad had encouraged him. Okay, Micah, keep your eye on the ball. Don't crowd the plate, son. He always called me son. I tried to make him to change it to brother, but he never did. Rain or shine, Tom was in the front row at all my games. I'd look over at him, and he'd wave his old cap at me. No matter how loud the crowd was, whenever I rounded third, I could always hear Tom calling, Come on home, son! Come on home! Tom was there for me during Little League, high school, and college. Every game, he'd be yelling, Don't crowd the plate, son! And come on home, son! He was the best cheering section a guy could have. Tom died my senior year in college. He never watched me as I worked my way through the minors and into the major leagues. But I know that Tom is in a far better place. I know that Tom is in the front row of heaven's great cloud of witnesses cheering me on in my journey through life. Whenever I stumble or run into hardships, I can always hear Tom's voice calling, Come on home, son. Come on home. stories ever and one of the most extraordinary feelings ever. The death of Jesus Christ was an act of love and for our salvation, yet he was still a son. A son whose mother had to watch her baby boy endure a horrific death. The pain of losing a child is a hard burden to carry, even for the mother of God. Here the mournful mother watch her son's final moments and breaths in my two selections, Were You There by William Barton and The Crucifixion Story from My Mother's Perspective by Bonnie Wisham. Sleep that eluded her that night and she was weary and worn as she stood there on Golgotha's hill hoping to get a glimpse of him, her son. Her eyes were heavy and tired from the lack of sleep and tears she had shed. Yet she strained all the harder to see him. Some had looked forward to this day for three years. And now the time was here. Suddenly, excitement filled the air. Crucify him! Crucify him! Mary saw the Roman soldiers. Someone carrying a heavy wooden cross and though her eyes could scarcely believe what they saw. She saw him, her son. As she continued to watch, her eyes caught a glimpse of the Roman soldiers as they took hold of her son and laid him down on the cross. She couldn't make herself believe what was about to happen next, but reality set in when the echoes of the hammers hitting, the nails being driven into the hands, and beating, leaving the heart wrenching down in her ears. Never would she be able to forget that sound. The soldiers hung the cross on which her son was nailed, placing them between two other crosses on which hung thieves. Thieves! There they would hang until death.
claims them. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Gazing on his face, her mind wandered back in time. She remembered how he made himself feel with every little movement or kick inside the womb. Those precious childhood years as Jesus grew from an infant to a young boy. Mary remembered the toothless grin on his face when he came home from fishing with just a tiny fish on his line. No amount of money, no worldly possessions, not even death could take away those precious moments from then, all too soon, those precious childhood years passed before her eyes with its scrapes and that dirty little face that was so endearing to Mary's heart. Never in her wildest dreams did she believe it would end up like this. Her son, a man who had never done any harm to anyone, whose heart was filled with love and compassion for others was now beaten, marred beyond recognition, and nailed to a cross, though he had lived a sinless life. His time had been spent teaching the scriptures, giving sight back to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raising the dead. And yet here he was, hanging in shame, all because some men decided to believe that he was not the Son of God. He was betrayed by one disciple, denied by another, the other scattered at the time of his arrest. Except for John, who was standing by her side. Mary wondered if they were the only ones who truly loved Jesus enough to stand by him. And when he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He hung his head and died. No more would evil men have to plot his death. No more would they have to speak ill of his name. No more beatings, no more crowns of thorns tearing at his flesh. No more pain, no more suffering. It is finished. And finally, she is able to go to her darling boy. She rocks him back and forth just as she had done when he was a child. He's gone. My boy is dead. How can I ever fill this hole that has been left in my heart? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb?
<clears throat> I guess it's natural for parents to cry on their kids' first day of school, but this usually happens when the child is five. I'm 15, and until today, I was homeschooled, which means my mom was the only teacher and my dad the only sub. But then it happened. My mom's articles about the familiar patterns of large animals earned her a full-time professorship at Northwestern University. So it was, goodbye Africa, hello Evanston, Illinois. Evanston was like Africa, except in every single way. Every high school has popular mean girls. Katie is stuck trying to find her new clique, deciding between the popular girls or the average misfits. How will Katie find her true friends? Find out in Mean Girls by Tina Fey. You don't want to sit there. Kristen Hadley sits there next to her boyfriend. Uh, don't sit there. Do you want to carry attendance sheets to the office every day? Uh, no. He farts a lot. Thanks. This is Damien, and I'm Janice. Nice to meet you. Watch out, please, new meet coming through. How do you spell your name? Caddy? It's Katie. Uh -huh. C-A-D-Y. <laughs> I am so going to offend you. What else is important that I can tell you about? The cafeteria is terrible. You're going to want to buy your lunch at the school store, and I recommend the white cheddar cheese. Damien, you are ridiculous. In the name of all that is holy, look at Karen Smith's diplos. Is that a shirt or a bandage? I don't know, Caddy, but I do know that Karen Smith is one of the dumbest girls you will ever meet. Damien sat next to her in English last year. She asked me how to spell orange. And see that little one next to her? That's Gretchen Wieners. She's rich because her dad invented toaster strudel. Did they do something to offend you? Uh, they're plastic. There's nothing they do that doesn't offend me. Toaster strudels cause cancer! <gasps> It was so weird to be in a real classroom with real people and real students and assemblies full of people. Now everybody give a round of applause for last year's Spring Fling Queen. She kicks off her reign today as head of the Student Activities Committee, Miss Regina George. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Norberry. I just want to say that under my rule, the SAC will do more than just sell candy canes and sponsor lame stuff like recycling. I have plans for some sick parties and being kind to the less fortunate, like you. New girl, come here. This girl is a new student and I'm going to make it my personal responsibility so that by the end of the year, she thinks Evanston High School is totally rad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Regina. You're welcome, girl. Come sit with us at lunch. <laughs> we had just moved here two weeks ago. Where did you get that bracelet? I love it. Africa. It's so fetch. <laughs> What's fetch? It's like slang from England. So if you're from Africa, why are you white? OMG, <laughs> Karen, you can't just ask people why they're white. <laughs> Katie, could you give us some privacy for a minute? Uh, no. no. Okay, Katie! Uh, Let me just say that we don't do this no, a lot, no. so you should know that this is like a huge deal. We want to invite you to have lunch with us every day for the rest of the week. Oh, okay. Great, so we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> On Wednesdays, we wear pink. You have to do it and tell me all the horrible things they say. Uh, Regina seems nice. Regina George is not nice. She's an evil dictator. She's the most plastic of all plastics. Well, what would we even talk about? Oh, uh, Chris Evans. The rising cost of Hydro Flash? Just do it, please! Okay, fine, I'll do it, but do you guys have anything pink? No. Yes! Having lunch with the plastics was like leaving the actual world and entering girl world. And girl world had a lot of rules. We only wear jeans or track pants on Friday, and you can only wear your tank top two days in a row, and your hair in a ponytail, that's only once a week. And so I guess you pick today, and if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. I mean, not just you, but any of us. So, how was your first week? Good, I think I'm gonna join the math athletes. Oh. No, 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 you cannot do that. That is social suicide. You are so lucky to have us to guide you. Come over to my house so we can continue your social lessons.
I'm home. Hey, 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 TGIF, you made it through the week. This is Katie. Hi, sweetheart. Welcome to our home. You want anything? Don't be shy. There are no rules here. I'm not like a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. Right, Regina? Please stop talking. I'm going to go make you guys a Friday treat. I never should have brought these capri pants. How many times do I have to tell you the gap is for old people? I hate my calves. Ugh, my hips are huge. At least you can wear skirts. I'm so long-waisted. My hairline's weird. My pores are huge. My nail beds suck. <laughs> uh, I have really bad breath when I wake up in the morning. Ew. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> hey, ladies. Four to six half hour. Thanks, oh, Mrs. George. Thanks, Mrs. J. Mrs. J. Mrs. G. O. M. D. You are so dyslexic. Is there alcohol in this? No, honey. What kind of mother do you think I am? Why well, do you want a little? If you're gonna drink, I'd rather you drink here. I'm fine, thanks. Well, don't be shy, right, girls? <laughs> Mom, go fix your hair or something. Oh, you girls keep me young. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I can't believe you still have this. <gasps> it's our burn book. We cut girls' pictures out of the yearbook in our comments. It's. Just a joke. Yeah. Veronica Rue is a Grotsky B. <laughs> Still true. Yeah. Madison Riley is a fat turd. <laughs> Still <laughs> half true. This is so mean. You should write something in it. No. Nobody would ever see it. I don't want to. Oh, why? Because you're so nice and we're evil. No. Here. Miss Norberry. I keep ecstasy oh. in my desk. That's hilarious. Is that true? And they have this book, this burn book, where they're like mean things about the girls in our grade. What does it say about me? Uh, you're not in it. Those brats. Katie, you've got to steal that book. I don't steal. We could publish it, and then everyone would see what an axe wound she really is. Uh-uh. I'll observe. That's it. If you can get close to Regina George, you have the responsibility to mess with her. I can't. Fine. Call me when you grow a pair. Fine, I will. How do you overthrow Regina George? You cut off her resources. You're gonna have to keep hanging out with them. I can't. What are Peltine bars? Oh, they're these weird Swedish nutrition bars that my mom used to give to the African kids. They make you gain weight. <laughs> And there are these weird Swedish nutrition bars that make you lose weight. Oh. It's all in Swedish. What's that? It's high in protein. I want to lose three pounds. Oh, what? you're, you're so, so skinny! skinny. <laughs> we have to crack Gretchen. She's the keeper of all the secrets. If this gets Gretchen to crack, we'll crack the lock of Regina's secrets. Say crack again. Crack. Let's meet tonight. Uh, why are you talking to Janice Ian? She's so weird. She just came up to me and started telling me about crack. She's so pathetic. <laughs> I was best friends with her in middle school. I know, right? So embarrassing. Then, in middle school, I started going out with my first boyfriend, but she was then weirdly jealous of him. Then her mom called my mom, and in the fall, she came back with her hair cut off, and I think she does heroin. Ho, 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 candy cane grams! Two Zimmerman, two for you! Glen Coco, a four for you, Glen Coco. You go, Glen Coco. <laughs> Caddy Heron, is there a Caddy Heron? It's Katie. Uh, a one for you. And none for Gretchen Wieners, but. <laughs> um, who's it from? Thanks for being a great friend. Love, Regina. Oh, that's so sweet. You got one too? It's just a candy cane. Maybe yours got lost. Is she mad at me? Has she said anything to you about me? Oh, nothing unusual. What do you mean? What's that? Usual stuff she says. I don't know, just that you talk a lot. No offense, but why would she give you a candy cane? She doesn't even like you that much. Oh, girls, girls. Gretchen, are you ready to present? Yeah. What's so great about Caesar? Brutus is just as smart as Caesar. Brutus is just as cute as Caesar. And when did it become okay for one person to be the boss of everybody? That's not what Rome is about. We should totally stab Caesar. <laughs> and with that, Gretchen Wieners, head cracked. Gretchen thinks you're mad at you.
Are you using the thing from Full House? No, it's that Janet Jackson song. No, that's everywhere I go. Every smile I make. Oh, that's it. 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 Oh,
What you don't know is that this cat's goal is to put you and you and your grandmother under its control. <laughs> but don't worry, I'll help you recognize their evil ways and their plan to enslave you. First, we will purr through the cat's tactics to control you. Then we will scratch our way through what cats will make you see their slaves. And finally, we will pounce on some ways to protect yourself from cat manipulations. Now, we all know how adorable cats are. All you have to do is look at them, and you instantly fall into a kitty cuteness coma. <sighs> but beware, the cat's cuteness is one of its best tactics to make you a slave. They take their big old glittery eyes and hypnotize you to become <laughs> its little puppet. First, they'll make you feel sorry for them. They do this by tilting their heads to give a look of innocence, or act as if they don't have anything or anyone to care for them. Then they'll bat their eyes and go onto their backs to lock their spell over humans. Finally, they will take their paws and play a piggy boo game, giving you glimpses of their adorable devil faces. Cats will also use their power of sound to enslave you. The cat's tiny meows and soft purrs have been mastered over thousands of years. But those sounds are trickery. What the cat is really saying is, Hey, sucker, you're putty in my paws now. But we are too stupid to realize what they are actually saying. So we respond with something like, Oh, yes, oh, yes, I love you, my little baby. <laughs> and if the cat's cute looks and sounds don't seduce you, they will turn to violence. Cats will attack you with hissing and scratching and biting. How do you think Nick here lost his eye? <laughs> That's right. A cat. They silently sneak up behind you. Slowly. Slowly. And then bam! All at once, cat has jumped up and lashed itself to its torso, and you can't do anything to defend yourself. Just imagine, standing there, doing absolutely nothing wrong, and then being in a full-blown cat attack. After all that scratching and biting, you'd be scarred for life. Literally. <laughs> we will now scratch our way through what cats will make you do as their slave. Cats are freeloaders. They make you spend all your time and money on them. They make you buy them toys and litter, and treats, and food. Don't even get me started on the food. Cats are so dependent on their slaves, they can't even get it themselves. So you are forced to go to the store and buy what seems to be a decent cat food brand. But no, it's not good enough. So you go back to the store to buy a more expensive brand. But they don't like that either. So you go back to the store ten more times to buy your precious little kitty food. But no matter how organic or tasty or expensive the food is, the cat won't eat it. You might as well give it a block of gold to chew on. Cats also make you do lovely little chores for them. You know that little box that sits in every cat owner's home? Yeah. Cats leave nice little treats for you to clean up in there. What's more is they watch us do it. They just sit there laughing some evil cat laugh. And thanking God they don't have thumbs to hold their own poop scoop. What's worse is if they forget where the litter box is, they'll choose somewhere else to go. Like under the table. On top of the laundry. And my personal favorite. Five inches away from the litter box. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a Tootsie Roll you found in your shirt the other day. <laughs> Cats also think they're entitled to your love and affection. They will crawl on top of their slaves' heads to demand a scratch behind the ears or some sweet talk. They'll even pull out the purr power to control their owner's hand. <gasps> Cats. Pet. Pet. But they control the amount of affection they want and when they want it. Cats are so evil, they'll butter you up with a sweet little muzzle 
and then snub you with the <laughs> hair up on your shoe. If you pick them up and they don't like it, boom, your eyes are scratched out. If you don't give enough attention to them, surprise, there is now a turd on your pillow. <laughs> and don't even bother naming your cats. They won't even pay attention to you anyways. You'll say, oh, come here, Mr. Sparkles. Come here, Kitty Winnie. And they just walk away with a whole lot of attitude like, oh, yeah, right. I am way too good for you. <laughs> we will now count on some ways to protect yourself from cat manipulations. First and foremost, avoid cats at all costs. Do not get a cat as a pet. Do not watch funny cat videos. But most of all, never look a cat in the eyes. However, if you must come in contact with a cat, there are some items essential to your safety and freedom. Some of these items include yarn, water, and catnip. You can use the yarn to distract the dumb cat long enough to make your escape. If you use the catnip, well, you can essentially use it to drug the cat to the point where it can no longer harm you. Peace, kitty kitty. And you can use the water, more famously known as cat be gone, to melt that evil cat like the Wicked Witch of the West. Spray. Spray. And you look like you own a cat. <laughs> For any reason, these items don't work to help keep those evil cats away. There is one last thing you can call on. The power of God. Be gone, demon cats. Take another look at this cat. Do you see the cute little animal it's pretending to be? Or the horrible, manipulative monster that it truly is? After scooping the truth out of the litter, we can all see what a cat's true intentions are. Their goal is to enslave us, but we not know their tactics, what they plan to use us for, and how to protect ourselves from their evil ways. However cute a cat might be, just remember what their true goal is, and never look a cat in the eyes. Hard and, and the, their work really, really paid off. So I'm, I'm extremely thrilled to work with kids that, who actually want to put in the time. And so I and invite you to, um, uh, well, some of them, the kids need to move the boxes and then everybody else can partake of uh, food. So, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming tonight and uh, being part of, of their and we have gifts for all the coaches. Oh. Thank you for all you do for our team. Thank you. you can offer them now if you want. Can we? 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 Can we?